I was out on a walk the other day with my girlfriend Pixel Girl in the fields near where we live, and we noticed that lots of people had the same idea. We were all walking in these fields, but separated by a large distance. And considering that we live in the current coronavirus pandemic, this was obviously a good thing. We were very far away from one another. But it got Pixel Girl thinking, and she asked me an interesting question. What is the maximum possible social distance? So how far away can everybody be from everyone else? So when we got home, naturally, I did what any good boyfriend would do. I downloaded a large geospatial data set and started calculating. Just me? To answer this question, you need to know two basic things. How many people are there on Earth, and how much area is available to put them in? Firstly, the world population is obviously increasing every day. It actually increases by about 220,000 people every day on average. So on any given day, you can't really hope to be more accurate than maybe 100,000 people. So for the purposes of this exercise, I'm treating the world population as 7 billion 811,700,000 people. Next, the area available on Earth. Now I'm going to assume that we don't want to put people on water or oceans or seas, so we're going to be evenly distributing people over all the available land surface area. So you could be put in the south of France, or the Mongolian steppe, or Antarctica. Bit of a luck of the draw, if I'm honest. Using the publicly available GM TED 2010 dataset, which has an angular resolution of 225 arc seconds, we'll come back to that number in a little bit, I calculated the available land area to be 149,678,000 square kilometers. So nice and simple, we take the total area, divide it by the total number of people, and we find that everybody has 19,162 square meters to roam around in. If we want to make sure that everyone is far away from everyone else to a maximum possible distance, we set this area to be the area of a circle, plonk ourselves in the middle, and then use the formula for the area of a circle to calculate the radius, which we find to be 78.1 meters. However, considering that everybody else is also going to be in their own little circle with this same radius, that means that the maximum possible social distance will be twice this radius, or 156.2 meters. Except that's a terrible answer. It's a terrible answer for three basic reasons. We'll go through those three corrections, and at the end of the video, I'll tell you the right answer. Firstly, you can't just divide the area into circles for everyone, because circles don't tessellate. That is, they don't fit together in a pattern with no gaps between them. We have to account for what's called the packing efficiency. In other words, how much of the space you could actually use. Because some mathematicians like this stuff, and because it is kind of an important problem, they've worked out that the most efficient way to pack circles on a flat surface is in a hexagonal pattern, which would leave only 9% of an infinite plane covered in circles unused. So the efficiency is 91%. That's easy to account for. A little bit more complicated is the second factor at work here, and that's that there are more places we can put people. Now, there are any number of places you could put extra people, but I'm going to ignore, for example, the International Space Station, submarines, caves, because the number of people you could fit in these places is so small that, to be honest, they're within the error bars of what the world population is on a given day anyway. Three locations that might make a difference, though, are boats, planes, and multi-story buildings. How many planes are there in the world? Well, the best guess I could find was from a website airliners.net, which estimated that between military planes and commercial jets and small pleasure craft, there's about 39,000 planes in the world. Now, considering that no plane has even come close to being 100 meters long yet, that means that we can pretty safely say that there's going to be one person on each of those planes. So we can remove 39,000 people from the world population that we're trying to place on the surface of the Earth. Ships are much the same story. In 2017, there was just shy of 58,000 registered boats in the world. But if we account for small pleasure craft and yachts, lifeboats, canoes, maybe we can round it up to a nice round 100,000. I know that's a pretty big stretch, but to be honest, when you're comparing 100,000 people to several billion people, this is still going to be a pretty small effect. Multi-story buildings, though, are kind of interesting. So if we could put one person on every floor of a multi-story building, we could save ourselves tons of space. The Burj Khalifa alone, for example, could house 163 people, one on each floor, in a tiny area. Now, generalizing that to all the multi-story buildings in the world is a really difficult calculation to try and do. Um, I gave it a janky go. I downloaded a data set from skyscrapercenter.com which gave the number of floors of 459 tall buildings. I then ranked them by the number of floors and plotted that number as you went along the list. I noticed that if you chafe off the data, lies at the top and bottom of this looks like an exponential distribution. So taking the log of the number of floors and then the physical linear equations of the data which converted to an exponential approximation. Then it was just a simple matter of finding where this function reached a building with two floors and integrating between this point to the very tallest building in the list. Give an answer of about 70,000. You could, you could fit about 70,000 people in all the multi-story buildings. 
This is actually pretty low. I expected it to be higher than this, but as I said, it's a janky approximation and any approximation of this is going to be limited by just how spread out the data is. So I'm happy to leave it as it is and just accept it's not the most accurate approximation in the world, but nice that we tried to account for it. Plus, you could definitely argue that a single floor separation in a building isn't enough to maintain a proper social distance anyway. Again, you're comparing 100,000 people-ish to several billion. Pretty small effect, guys. That leaves just one factor to account for, but it's a big one. Orography. Orography is how the height of land above sea level changes as you move around horizontally. And that's important because it actually increases the total amount of land area available to us. Imagine that there's a 150 meter cliff and we place one person at the top of it. Now, if you don't account for orography, the closest you could put someone else would be about 150 meters away horizontally. But instead of doing that, we could just put that person at the bottom of the cliff. They're still 150 meters away, and so safe from the coughs and sneezes that spread diseases. <coughs> More generally, if you have two people that are some horizontal distance apart, but also some vertical distance apart, then their actual separation is going to be given by the hypotenuse of the triangle formed by those two distances. And to calculate that, we can just use my favorite Python library, Pythagoras. Speaking of Python, this is why I downloaded that GMTED dataset. Each pixel here represents a data point showing the height of the land in meters above sea level. To calculate the Earth's land area before, what I did was work out the area of each pixel, given by the radius of the Earth, which is actually latitude specific, it's slightly bigger at the equator and smaller at the poles, multiplied by the angular resolution of the data, which is that 225 arc seconds figure I mentioned before, all squared, multiplied by the cosine of latitude to account for the fact that pixels get smaller as you get nearer to the poles. After all, the Earth isn't a flat plane, it's a sphere. You then add up the area of all the pixels that are land, and boom, you have a total land area. But remember, in calculating the area of these pixels, we shouldn't just be looking at the horizontal spacing of them, we should be looking at the hypotenuse formed between them, which means accounting for the variation in height between adjacent pixels. To do this, I divided up this grid into triangles and worked out the hypotenuse of all of the edges given the height data contained in the GNTED 2010 dataset. It was then just a case of calculating the area of all of these individual triangles and adding up the ones which were on land. And because we've accounted for the changes in height, this area is bigger than the area I first calculated. That simple calculation gave an area of 149,678,000 square kilometers. Accounting for the changes in height, we now find an area of 150,492,000 square kilometers. So what difference does that make? Well, if we account for the 91% hexagonal packing efficiency, put over 200,000 people on planes, boats, and in multi-story buildings, and more importantly, account for changes in orography, we find that the maximum possible social distance is 149.4 meters. So all of those factors combined produced a loss of some seven meters of maximum possible social distance. Now all of the loss in that was because of the packing efficiency, but accounting for the orography, for the changes in the height of the earth, actually clawed back about 40 centimeters of maximum possible social distance for everyone on Earth. Incidentally, all the space we gained from putting people in planes and boats and in multi-story buildings was about two millimeters per person. And I actually checked, if we were underestimating the number of people we could put in buildings by a factor of 10, then we would have gained some six millimeters extra. It's still a really small contribution, guys. I just knew that if I didn't talk about it, the comments would be full of it. Of course, there are lots of small factors to still consider, and I do expect to see them talked about down there in the comments, such as, you know, subgrid processes, like not fitting people into rivers or into lakes, or how you pack people on tiny islands or peninsulas efficiently. But these are subgrid processes, meaning that they occur at a scale smaller than the resolution of the data that I have. If you happen to have incredibly high resolution spatial data and you want to tackle this and do this video again with higher resolution, please be my guest. But still, I hope that this video showed you that what at first glance seems to be quite a simple calculation actually has some quite interesting and quite important caveats. And also that even in a worst case scenario, we have to spread out as much as possible, we actually have quite a bit of space to go around. According to my calculations, the amount of space that we would each have in this scenario would mean we could each own our own St. Mark's Square in Venice. 
it just might be in Antarctica. I hope that you are all staying safe and at home wherever you are. And if you're not, if you're one of these people doing a key profession like working in a hospital or stocking groceries or keeping the lights on, then thank you so much for what you are doing. Let's hope that we can all go back to normal as soon as the circumstances allow. If you did enjoy the video, then please do share it in your coronavirus group chats because everybody has several and pop it a like. And if you are still after stuff to occupy yourself with to watch, then I've made lots of videos. Here's Two, just up there. That just leaves me to say thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Now wash your hands.